au clear, which is what Dianetics sells, that's a thirty-five to seventy-five thousand dollar project. You don't know that. So there's your first bait and switch. You buy a three dollar book, and it's going to cost you fifty to seventy-five grand. Some Scientologists pay even larger sums to move from Dianetics onto Scientology's more advanced spiritual pathway, the Bridge to Total Freedom. The bridge contains a series of levels designed to increase your spiritual powers. Once you go clear, they say, well, forget about that. You need to go spiritually free. Well, hang on, I just got in to get rid of the mind. Now you're telling me I've got to go spiritually free? And there's another switch. But they don't tell you that's going to cost you as well. And there's this whole route all the way through the top. Oh, that'll run you 150 to 250 grand. How much did you spend in all? Well, prior to, prior to the marriage and, and uh, with the marriage, I would say a total between my wife and I at the time, maybe four to 500,000. I'll just stack these in here. Okay, we need to shift our roll to right. start stacking. One Australian family who fell foul of the hard sell were the Andersons from Canberra. Now they've left the church, this is their third trip to the rubbish tip to offload their stock of Scientology materials. Many thousands of dollars, eh? Have the tips open today. <laughs> As public Scientologists trying to master the teachings of L. Ron Hubbard, they found themselves deluged with phone calls asking them to buy more and more of his books. We were receiving up to 250 phone calls a fortnight to buy books. If not to buy books, to donate books. If not to donate books, it's to um, buy a second set, you know? It is an enormous commercial enterprise, isn't it? Uh, no, it's a religion. It's a, it's a large international religion that, um, that, you know, is exactly that, a religion. But it makes an awful lot of money. Um, well, the church is definitely the beneficiary of, the, uh, of its parishioners and people who uh, feel strongly about their, their religion and choose to give back to it and give to the planet as a result. What many parishioners never discover, unless they pay to work their way up the bridge, is that L. Ron Hubbard, a prolific author of science fiction, wrote a secret scripture in 1967. In it, he describes how an evil intergalactic warlord called Xenu visited Earth millions of years ago and the spirits or body thetans of people he killed are the cause of many of mankind's spiritual ills. I was one of the first people who was introduced to and read the materials and was expected to start exorcising these body thetans, the body spirits, from my body. I couldn't believe the material, yet I knew I had to for my own survival and for my own eternal salvation. By 1985, Scientology's elite unit, the Sea Org, was back on dry land, and Joe Reish joined up in Florida to work for the church full time. There, he married a fellow Scientologist. How much were you paid? Uh, at the time, I was paid uh, $20 a week bit of a come down from your football days. Exactly. I mean, the, uh, the hourly rate was uh, into the uh, maybe 12 to 15 cents an hour. But, you know, at that time, we, di we didn't consider it because we were getting fed. And we had some birthing, despite the fact that it wasn't the greatest. We felt that we were at least contributing to something. Everyone who joins the Sea Org signs a contract for a billion years, making a commitment to return and serve the church for endless lifetimes to come. Joe Reich was the go-to man when wealthy donors who were disillusioned with Scientology wanted their money back. I was their number one boy uh, in Florida for doing all of these, um, let's call it resolutions and solving those problems. In 1986, Joe Reich and his wife took steps to leave the Sea Org. Later, they divorced, but they and their children remained Scientologists. For 19 years, Joe Reish had jobs outside the church, often as a personal fitness trainer. Privately, he started questioning the church. 
I had mentioned various things that I had some disagreements with, you know, to someone like, why is it so expensive? And then that person would write a report about that and send it in. <laughs> Joe Reesh knew he had a fight on his hands. In 2005, he was summoned to an internal inquiry called a Committee of Evidence, where the secret internal reports on him were disclosed. He was accused of entering into bad investment deals and breaking the rules of the church. But he says he wasn't allowed to see the reports, call witnesses, or have any kind of legal representation. Months later, the committee handed down its final report, shown here for the first time. I went through the seven or eight page report that just basically listed out all of my crimes. Where they accused me of things that I said I wasn't guilty, they said, you're guilty, and here's the evidence. But the evidence was from those reports that were hearsay. Joe Reesh was declared a suppressive person and expelled from the church. But when he picked up the phone to call his children, he couldn't get through. No response. I called again, no response. And then I realized, oh my God, here's what they did. They already had me declared a suppressive person. They told everyone else, including my children. I cried. I was sad, you know, it's my kids. But... You don't do that to a parent. You don't do that. And so... Did you talk to your kids after that? Mm -hmm. A spokesperson for the children told Four Corners that claiming that the Church of Scientology is the reason for a disconnection from his children does not tell the entire story. Joe decided long before 2005, by his own actions, to separate himself from his family, an assertion that Joe Reesh denies. Why was Joe Reesh declared a suppressive person? I have no idea. I have no idea. It's news to me. I, I, actually, I actually know Joe Reesh. I, I remember meeting him many years ago. He was somebody that I knew personally uh, when I first started working with the church. I, in fact, I had no idea he'd even been expelled from the church. But once you expel someone from the church, you tell that person's family inside the church to have nothing to do with them. No, that is not the case. What, what, it, what specifically what you're referring to is if somebody is expelled from the church, um, anybody who insists on continuing to be connected to somebody who's been expelled from the church would be told that as long as they maintain that connection, they're not welcome in the church because a church, any organization, and particularly a church like other churches, has a right to not welcome in its in its uh, in its ranks people who are supporting or connected to people who are attacking the church and mean the church harm. Right, well, last time I saw her, actually. In Australia, other families have experienced the intense pain of disconnection from their children in the church. Liz Anderson hasn't seen her eldest child, Fiona, since 2005, when she was posted overseas from Sydney to work in the Sea Org in Clearwater, Florida. Now all she has left are these few mementos of Fiona's childhood. The tiger's netball club. Look, she's a beautiful girl. I mean, I just... Uh, and she's mine. I don't know. Can't take the parent away. <laughs> I'll try.